Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Keith, and today is Sunday, which means that we are back on that Hyperion train. We're on the third book, which is awesome. Um, I mean, it's awesome that we're on the third book, but also the third book is awesome. Um, so far, Endymion has been a freaking blast uh i've really loved reading it can't recommend it highly enough if y'all are listening to this podcast and you're not reading the books then you should do yourself a favor and read the books um if you've listened to the first two episodes you could probably just start the um endymion book uh you could probably just start the endymion book and start listening to it and catch up with me um i'm going pretty slowly i have to keep stopping myself because if I listen to too much, then I'll have too much to talk about, and I won't be able to cover everything that's happening, um, which is a good thing, ultimately, um, but is also, uh, I don't know if I want to say like a bad thing necessarily, but yeah, it's, it's just generally, I don't know, I'm really excited about this book, um, especially after this last week. There, Dan Simmons is just doing a really good job of constantly like upping the stakes, upping the upping his game as a writer. Uh none of the other books, the second two, the end of Hyper or sorry, the Fall of Hyperion or Endymion have compared stylistically to the first book. I still think the first book is the best book in the series and it is it is absolutely a standalone book. Um I have a lot of friends who have read this series and they said the same thing to me, and at first I didn't quite understand how that was possible because, like, you know, when there's a series of books, like Harry Potter, for instance, um, you don't just read one. <laughs> Does not make any sense to do that? I guess Harry Potter, maybe each one kind of could stand on its own until you get to about book three, and then she starts really putting cliffhangers in there where it's like, okay, now we have to see where this is going to go. So I guess the first two can kind of stand on their own as, like, fun children's stories about Hogwarts. But, and then, you know, even book two kind of has some some cliffhangers in it as to, like, well, who is Tom Riddle and what pertinence does he have, I guess. So I think it's pretty evident that, um, what's her face? J.K. Rowling, um... May her cancered, uh, cancered, canceled self rest in peace. Um, I know a lot of people are really not a big fan of her, um, but people love Harry Potter so much it's hard to uh, just ba- just say like, oh, we're kind of done with this person. But she's made some pretty um, supposedly questionable statements. I'm not going to get into my opinion on those statements. Uh, I will just say, in my opinion, the desire to maybe kind of separate her from the greatness of Harry Potter is justified in some capacities, especially by a lot of specific communities. But that's neither, that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, we are here to talk about Endymion and why it's so good. But uh, I would compare Endy- or Hyperion, the novel, to Ender's Game, where there's clearly more to the story at the end of Ender's Game. But at the end of Hyperion... There, it kind of has its own succinct message that makes it pretty easy for you to just kind of stop there and, like, be okay with it. Um, if you feel the desire to move on, obviously the, the other books are amazing. And Fall of Hyperion is, uh, so far, probably my favorite plot-wise. 
But as far as, like, again, stylistically, uh, like, showing off Dan Simmons' abilities as an author, I would say that the first book is really the strongest one to do that. But that's not what this episode is about. Uh, This episode is about the next few chapters of Endymion. And so we're going to kind of pick up where we left off, which I don't remember exactly where we had left off. Um, I think that where we left off last was that Endymion and Abedic and Ania had all arrived on Hebron and were in the process of reviving Rawl from Rawl as and Rawl as Rawl and Endymion, just for future reference, um, reviving him from his escapades <laughs> on Mare Infinitum. Um, and the next planet that they go to is called Sol Draconi Septum, and it's really intense. And Dan, Dan Simmons, man, uh, he keeps on leaving these huge cliffhangers at the end of chapters and then going to the other part of the story. And I, or the other half. So, like, the, the book is kind of divided into chapters about Father Captain DeSoya and then about Endymion, Ania, and Abedic. And the chapters that are uh, Ania, Endymion, and Abedic are supposedly written by or being told by Endymion himself. And I don't know who's telling the chapters in DeSoya's. Uh, narrative because they seem like they're from DeSoya's perspective but I just I think that we're gonna kind of figure out exactly what it is that is happening with him relatively soon so I'm gonna kind of start out with where he is and what happened with him before we get to Ania and Abedic and Endymion so if we remember correctly from last week uh Captain Father DeSoya had arrived on Mare Infinitum, the ocean planet, uh, which whenever I say that, I think of the, um, what is that pan's name? Ocean Man. It's in the SpongeBob movie, which is hilarious. Um, I can't remember the name of the band for the life of me off the top of my head, but they have a song called Ocean Man, and it's hilarious. So they're on this ocean planet, and uh, Father Captain DeSoya has discovered that there is or that the person who's in command of the platform that they're on, the platform that Roland Dimian was on, is actually pretty dang corrupt. Um, They launch a ton of investigations after the initial discovery of the fact that he was hiding the, um, what is it, Hawking, I almost said Falconing Drive, (laughs) the Hawking Drive, or the Hawking Mat, so when they discover that he's hiding it, in f- instead of it having like flown off like he first claimed, he's arrested, and then the whole station gets put under investigation by uh, Father Captain DeSoya because he has the papal disc key and can pretty much command anything. Um, he literally has all of the authority of the Pope and then a little bit more. So it's kind of a big deal that he has it. And as I mentioned last week, it's been a problem whenever he's gone to different worlds because those worlds have been like, well, why do you have all this authority? We need to make sure that this is true. Okay, now that we know that it's true, what are you doing? And now that we know what you're doing, um, what can we do to help? Like that type of thing. So it was slowing him down. But in this particular case, it really helped him out. Uh, What he finds out is that there's kind of like this delicate balance of corruption is the exact way that Dan Simmons kind of says it. And I think a delicate balance of corruption between the poachers and the packs um, and then the fishermen who come to the planet to to, uh, basically fish for the leviathans is what they're called. Um, They're basically like giant undersea creatures that live like tens of thousands of or not ten, like thousands of fathoms deep um apparently the ocean near where endymion had been was about twelve thousand fathoms deep so uh yeah it was pretty freaking deep um i don't know exactly how long a fathom is i could probably look it up but i you know i'm lazy so i'm not going to do that but basically it's really freaking deep and the 
reason that we know how deep it is is because <laughs> uh, Father Captain DeSoya decides that he wants to sweep the entire ocean floor near where the conflict happened, which is insane because, you know, anything that goes down to the bottom, the pressure of it getting down to the bottom is pretty intense. Um, Captain DeSoya also decides that he's going to try to, like, match the fingerprints that they can pull from the mug that Endymion touched and match fingerprints from a couple other things. And he sends uh, Fa- Father Gregoria, or Captain Gregorius uh, out to do this. He sends Gregorius back to Hyperion because... What he realizes is that if the girl is traveling with somebody, the most likely person that she's traveling with is the person who took her from their grasp on Hyperion. So it's either the Shrike or two other people who they could trace. And this particular thing, so what they they find, or they go, or sorry, Gregorius goes back to Hyperion, and they are able to match the fingerprints of Rawl to fingerprints that Rawl gave and DNA Rawl gave for identification purposes when he was enlisted in the Hyperion Home Guard, where he actually did pretty well. He was like a third-class lieutenant or something like that, lieutenant third-class or sergeant third-class, which I don't know if Dan Simmons is like relating this back to actual military service. If he is, I don't know exactly how high up a third-class sergeant is, but... The the PAX people seem genuinely surprised about it. They, of course, also find out that he supposedly died, but they clearly know that he didn't. Um, if I had to guess, I think that there's some sort of weird like time travel paradox that's going on in this whole thing where, uh, like, and I've mentioned this before, going through Farcaster portals is like simultaneously moving position but also maybe changing time because of time debt that would normally be accrued across ships so i think that there's you know and a lot of these books have relied on the relationship of time to other things so i think that there's gonna be a fair amount of um what's the word i'm looking for uh discrepancy until we get like the full picture of exactly what it is that's happening with ania and the farcaster portals and therefore endymion and everybody else but all that to say desoya discovers that Endymion was indeed on Mare Infinitum long after the time of which he would have been considered dead, and they even buried his body in the ocean. So who knows exactly how it is that... It hasn't been explained how um, uh, Silenus, Martin Silenus, who saved Rawl, it hasn't been explained how he did exactly what it was that he did. So my guess, honestly, is that DeSoya is going to find Martin Silenus and then wait for Aenea to come back um, with Silenus uh, or around or near Silenus in order, and then he'll capture her when she comes back to Hyperion to see Silenus after she's kind of accomplished some of the things that she's looking to accomplish. So back to the, like, delicate balance of corruption that has supposedly been disrupted by uh, Father Captain DeSoya's investigations into the PAC's military activities. He finds out that it goes pretty far up the ladder um, and that it's very likely that the majority of these platforms that are manned by PAX, uh, PAX military and, or PAX, pe- PAX military soldiers, PAX soldiers, I don't know. Any of the platforms controlled by the PAX military are likely participating in some form of small to major corruption that involves money laundering, that involves uh, like specific things with the um, violations of legislation regarding the fishing of the Leviathans and things like that. And so everybody's kind of in everybody else's pockets. And because there's no hegemony, there's no unified law thing or law bo- it, law body law-abiding body i don't know um it seems like my guess is that most of the planets that they've been to have had something like this happening on them and that's part of why it was such a trudge for father captain DeSoya to get anything accomplished on those planets and in those places because he's fighting this uphill battle against all these people who are like well you know pax doesn't check in on us regularly so we're gonna kind of dip our hands into this honey 
even though we're not necessarily supposed to. It seems like pretty standard religious stuff. Um, And I am going to make kind of like a statement about that right after this quick commercial break. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. three commercial breaks i think so there's two more so be excited (laughs) um when uh the last thing i was talking about before the break was this idea that there's kind of like a um a running trope that i think dan simmons is kind of trying to capitalize on when it comes to the idea of organized religion specifically in reference to the way in which an organized religion's governing body quote-unquote uh, governs specifically in regards to the Catholic church. Um, now I know it's kind of a cheap shot in general and well, in my opinion, it's generally a cheap shot for authors to comment on the Catholic church because the Catholic church is this large religious body made up of a bunch of people who have, in my opinion, arbitrarily decided that somehow their religious book supports the idea of a global, enforcing governance that is known as the entity of the church in a similar fashion to how the previous iteration of that particular monotheistic faith faith that being judaism had a king and a temple the church has kind of supplanted the temple the catholic church has has supplanted the temple and then justified its existence through the interpretation of miscellaneous texts in the bible and then has continued to support these ideas by creating advantageous translations and interpretations of specific texts without using the proper contexts provided by a true hermeneutic study of those texts. So, all that to say, the Catholic Church is pretty easy pickings, in my opinion, um, because it just is kind of a baseless governing a governance or a baseless system of governance for religion when you look at the principles intrinsic to the general teachings of the new testament which is what they base their existence off of it's pretty clear in the new testament that governing and governance is not within the realm of interest in regards to religious beliefs so the fact that there is this like governing body that kind of dictates what is sin and what is not, dictates what is proper and what is not, is just a method to control people through religion, in my opinion. And I would think that Dan Simmons is kind of affirming that idea. Now, this was written in the 90s, so I will give him a little bit of credit that like that trope wasn't quite completely dead at the time. There was still enough material... And not as many people critiquing organized religion than as there might be now. Though I would guess as far as like if you compared the amount of writing to the amount of people critiquing the church, the density percentage would be the same. So if like 10% of things that are published critique the church at the time, then I would say 10% of things now critique the church but or religion in general. But because there's so much more stuff being published now, it just seems like there's actually more of it. So objectively, there is more of it, but I would wager that it's occurring at the same rate. But I would have to actually look into those numbers in order to make an absolute statement about whether or not that was true. 
regardless, the most important part of this is that I think what Simmons is trying to show us, and this is evidenced later on by what happens with Captain DeSoya, but we'll get there, um, is that ultimately governing bodies usually fail. Um, the Roman Empire fails, the Turkish Empire fails, all of these large systems of centralized government ultimately lead or ultimately contribute to their own destruction in a myriad of different ways, whether that's corrupt leaders or uh, like a general change in culture or being conquered by another up and coming empire. Every human empire has fallen in some regard due to in miscellaneous influencing factors. So I think that uh, what Simmons is trying to show through the fact that this Mari Infinitus is so corrupt and there's this delicate balance of corruption is that people are kind of like perpetual toddlers in that they're always pushing boundaries. How far can we get into the realm of corruption or into the realm of misbehavior before it is that we get caught and that we're made to stand trial, quote unquote, uh, for the things that we've chosen to do. And so I think that in having all of this corruption present on Mari Infinitus, it's just kind of evidencing the fact that ultimately all governing bodies are insufficient for ensuring the safety and well-being of human beings and that human beings will do the things necessary to achieve that kind of autonomy and prosperity themselves. And they'll do that by pushing the boundaries of the system that they're told they're supposed to work within as much as possible. And this kind of gets to something else that I think that uh, Dan Simmons has maybe done a little bit of is this idea of like not knowing what it is that you're doing wrong is the it makes it so that you're not doing that thing wrong. And this is a bit of a stretch, so I'm not going to go too far into it. If it comes up again later, then which I'm sure it will, um, then we'll talk about it there. But just basically kind of in the back of my mind, I have this sneaking suspicion that part of Dan Simmons outlook on this whole, you know, a re organized religious group as a governing body is going to be that ignorance is kind of bliss. And so the more knowledge it is that Father DeSoya acquires, the more compromised it is that he'll be. And this is evidenced in the fact that when he gets Roland Dimian's uh, fingerprints and kind of figures out what may, you know, a little bit more of maybe what it is that this the that Ania is trying to accomplish in her her fleeing from the packs, he decides that he's going to divert from the original plan of traveling to each of the Farcaster portals via the shortest possible jumps. And he decides that instead of jumping to the next sector with uh, within closest like proximity to the Farcaster planet that they're on, they're going to go to the closest outback or, and more specifically, ouster world, ouster-occupied world that is available to them. And that ends up being Hebron. Now, I this when Simmons said that I was immediately became suspicious that I think that Ania traveled to a Hebron of the future and not a Hebron of the current timeline or time period that they are in, especially considering that everybody on Hebron was gone. They were the only people there. So to me, that says that she they traveled into a specific type of future in which the ousters had done a specific thing that was based off of something else that they had been told to do. Because every other ouster interaction that we've had with ouster-occupied worlds has been that the ousters completely ransack and destroy the place. But nothing on Hebron was destroyed. Just the people were gone. And they were gone in such a way that if we uh, you know, remember correctly, specifically Aenea and Endymion mentioned that even like there's no roaming animals. There's just no life. So the fact that means that the occupants of Hebron were able to gather, have enough time to gather up their things and leave. Now, this could be attributed to like maybe a reference to the idea that the original Jewish people were very nomadic. Because if you remember correctly, Hebron is 
the new Jewish world, new Jerusalem. And so it could be referenced to the fact that they just got up and left and moved someplace else because they did only go to one city on Hebron. I think it was the capital. But regardless of that, I still think that Ania, when she got to Hebron, was in the future in some regard, um, especially since the especially since Hebron was not on the original Tethys. So the fact that it's not on the original River Tethys to me indicates that a Farcaster portal is built there either in the past before everybody gets there or in, more likely in the future after everybody has left for a specific pur- purpose. And obviously we haven't had any ra- interactions with the Technocore, but we know that they still exist because Ania has said that she's interacted with them. So to me, this is evidence to the idea that you know, at some point, a Farcaster portal is added to Hebron after everybody has left by either the Ousters or the Technocore or both potentially or whatever new governance is present in the future timeline it is that Ania travels to. So I think that when uh, Father Captain DeSoya and his crew translate to uh, or go to travel to Hebron, they're actually traveling they are decades or years behind when Aenea would have been there. And this is indicated further by the following. So when they decide that they're going to go to these ouster occupied worlds, what they realize is that the uh, or what someone points out is that the ousters are not aware of the archangel technology that is employed by Pax. And the archangel technology, I think, is the faster than light travel that they have the ability to employ in order to travel faster than like Ania's ship could. So they, uh, when they spin up, they die. The acceleration or the translation to that speed kills them immediately. And because they all, because they've found a way around the degradation of resurrection by the original cruciforms, they, are able to, you know, use this form of travel on Archangel ships specifically. And what they mention is that if the Ousters were to get a hold of a PAX-controlled Archangel ship, that the Ousters would now have access to that technology and could potentially reverse engineer something similar that maybe doesn't kill them on translation, or something, you know, like if you could put a bomb on, just basically strap engines to a bomb and then send a signal to that bomb to detonate or time it or something, then it would be pretty easy for them to just basically make bombs travel really fast. So, you know, there's military pertinence to the monopoly that PAX has on, the PAX has on this particular technology. So they set up the ship and they program it to immediately translate from Hebron if it is going to be captured if its capture is imminent by ousters but what from what we know there were no ousters on hebron so you know we as readers are kind of like oh well that's going to be purposeless they're going to get to hebron and nothing's going to happen well dan simmons super subverts that expectation by not even letting um father captain desoya set foot on hebron so they translate to hebron die and then when father captain desoya wakes up he's back on pacham pacham if you uh remember is the capital of the pax it is the home of the new catholic church it's the home of this quasi governing body that the pax has created in uh, in order for them to kind of like spread the gospel, quote unquote, the gospel or the sac- specifically spread the sacrament of the new cruciforms or of cruciforms in general. So when he wakes up, he is being a, or he sees uh, one of the resurrection priests that he thought he would never see again. And at first I was like, oh, is he having a delusion? Is he not really alive? Like what happened here? And then we realize pretty quickly that he is not, in fact, he is, in fact, not hallucinating. So what he's experiencing is, you know, at least as real as we can think it is. And then he is addressed by another higher up who uh, Captain DeSoya quickly realizes is actually interrogating him uh, about 
why it is that he did what he did on Mare Infinitum, as well as why it is that he decided to translate to Hebron. Because there were a couple things that happened in that translation process that are pretty interesting. So we're going to take our next quick commercial break. and When we get back, we'll talk about Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. I'm maybe not sure if I'm going to have enough time to talk about all the things that I want to talk about, so I guess I should get back to it. Um, right before the break, we were talking about how DeSoya had translated to Hebron after programming the ship, his archangel ship, which is Michael or... I can't remember the name. Raphael. There we go. Raphael is the name of his ship. So after programming the Raphael, his archangel ship, to immediately leave Hebron's system if capture by ousters was imminent, he wakes up in Pachum and finds out that he is in fact being investigated slash interrogated by the uh, pa- some of the Pax authority. The person that is interrogating him, I can't remember his name but basically uh he kind of acts as like a lawyer it seems or a negotiator and he seems very hesitant to give captain DeSoya any information that DeSoya does not specifically ask for but it seems that he's at least honest when he answers the questions that DeSoya does ask which is very lawyerish of him and DeSoya notices this so DeSoya is of course confused because he expected to wake up in his resurrection crash in Hyperion system, or sorry, in Hebron system, and to make planet fall and interact with the Jewish people, or at least someone on Hebron. But what he finds out is that he did not, in fact, do any of that. Apparently, uh, according to the ship logs, they arrived at Hebron and began the resurrection process, but that resurrection process was interrupted, which means that it was halted. And then had to restart. Now this is a big deal. Because the sacrament of resurrection. Is like very specifically done in a certain way. In the church. In order to mitigate. Or eliminate the effects of constant. uh, Revival. You know. uh, By. Or constant resurrection. By the cruciform, because if you remember the Pecora from the first book, which is so funny, I can remember a ton of stuff from the first book vividly. Um, I think I just really enjoyed it so much that it sticks with me. But regardless, the reason that they hypothetically, the reason that they were the way that they were was because of their, uh, you know, hundreds of years of being resurrected via the um, cruciform. And they actually seemed to have some religious association with it as well, which is, again, why I think that it is, in fact, the crew that travels with Captain Father DeSoya that becomes the Pecora and sent, gets sent back in time somehow um, in order to, like, ensure that this whole thing happens. I don't know exactly what it is that um, Dan Simmons is going to do to explain the existence of time travel in this world. And I've mentioned this several times because if the Pecora exist in the past, 
because they existed in the future, then that means that they wouldn't have existed in the past, or if they did exist in the past, that like they wouldn't have existed at some point. I think it's the time travel paradox is the basic fallacy that we're kind of looking at with this. So I'm not sure if Dan Simmons is just going to ignore that, or if he's going to go the multiple realities route, which is normally the go-to for people who want to incorporate time travel. Which feels kind of disingenuous and unsatisfying because then it's like, okay, well, that means that there's a bunch of timelines in which this story never happened, and that's kind of frustrating. Um, though I will say what's funny is there are philosophers who think that there are timelines in which, like, every possible thing happened. So, like, even dragons or unicorns or whatever, and that, like, the mysticism and things that we experience – uh, on this earth, things that seem outside of our explanation are like our experiences of alternative timelines or alternative realities that we manifest, not manifest, but that we kind of like can perceive in short, short bouts. So there's like interconnectedness between all of these simultaneous timelines um, that are both happening. Like they're happening at all times in all places. It's kind of like the movie arrival. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see Simmons go that route but again, that feels kind of unsatisfying because it's like, okay, well, you know, there's a line, there, there's a timeline where the the hege- hegemony doesn't figure out that the Farcaster portals are the network that is allowing the Techno Core to control them, and blah 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 blah. Which you know, it is what it is. Regardless, um, what we find out is that when he did translate to Hebron system, Father Captain DeSoya's ship started the whole resurrection process it gets interrupted this is a big deal i mentioned why that's when we went down the tangent so then uh it tra- it's supposed to translate back to mare infinitum which it does but once it gets there before it can finish the resurrection process these other individuals within the pax governing system basically the like vice pope uh like both vice popes though one of them is referred to as basically being the prime minister of the Pax, um, they decide that they're going to put DeSoya under investigation because he basically ran up a huge bill on Mare Infinitum. So I kind of diverted from the original time that he spent there because I wanted to get to this. But basically, on Mare Infinitum he ends up deciding that they're going to sweep the entire ocean floor. But in order to do that, they have to kill like five Leviathans and the Leviathans are worth like basically millions of dollars because of all the resources that come from their carcasses. And so he spends a bunch of money killing them and then harvesting them and then selling them. Right. Which does recoup some of the loss, but not a lot. And he gives that money directly to, the people who uh, kill them, he gives it like a bounty on these things. So they kill five of them, and then they decide to go down into the depths. And they are described pretty cool. They're like they've got a bunch of different mouths, and each mouth could swallow like the entire platform that they're on. So it's pretty intense. Um, it's a pretty cool thing. I, it doesn't go into detail how they kill them, but I definitely love this idea um, that that uh, Dan Simmons created on this world. The whole world building of Mario Infinitum is really cool. But they end up taking these submersibles down, which is expensive in itself, obviously, and crewing them, etc. And they bring up a bunch of stuff from the bottom of the seafloor. And one of the things they bring up is, of course, Braun Lamia's pistol. And uh, if I had to guess, um, that's going to come back into the possession of uh, Father Captain DeSoya at some point and be important in his story. You know, it seems like... um, Literal Chekhov's guns are a pretty big deal in Dan Simmons' novels. But regardless, he decides that he's going to, you know, he tries to, he gets able to lift a fingerprint from it, which he spent a ton of money on getting uh, investigators and scientists who could lift partial fingerprints. And so he decides to try to pull a fingerprint from it, it, succeeds, and then that matches with Rawls' fingerprint, and that's how they get a positive ID after the Hyperion thing and decide to go to Hebron. So he runs up this huge bill, arrests a bunch of people, sends the archbishop of the planet to a monastery, like really uses that papal disky authority. And this upsets a very delicate balance, not only on the planet, but a delicate balance within the entire Pax military system. Because the Pax military is not necessarily the church. It's just heavily affiliated with the church. 
So the individuals in the Pax military system follow the orders of the church, but the people who run it are kind of their own separate authority is how it's phrased. So that it seems like they're they're not intrinsically tied together. It's enough it, it makes it seem like quasi safe to deal with one or the other without realizing that you're getting both. Um is what, you know, how it's kind of described by uh Endymion at the beginning of the novel. And so what Captain Father De Soya realizes is that he is now enrolled in this investigation that has been brought on by the individuals who run the Pax military system. This is my understanding of it, so if I'm wrong, please definitely correct me in the comments. But he's in this investigation, which is basically rephrased as the Inquisition. And he makes specific mention that the Inquisition of now lives up to the Inquisition of the past in its reputation and in its actuality. So... I think what we're going to see is that DeSoya is about to undergo a lot of crud. We also find out that one of the individuals who was supposed to be resurrected, uh, the Lancer Corporal who actually mentioned that the ship, or that the Ousters didn't ever have, had never had access to uh, Archangel technology, he's actually dead. So I honestly wouldn't be surprised if the... Church was actually tracking Captain DeSoya's movements, and when they found out he was translating to Hebron, they stopped him, and this guy happened to be far enough along in the resurrection process to see it, and so they had to get rid of him, um, because they say that he ended up in space somehow, but that doesn't make any sense, because they didn't mention anything of a, an attack. They mentioned that after they translated to Hebron, Hebron, the ship translated back to Mari Infinitum. The politicians and people in charge of the Pax military stopped the resurrection from occurring there again, and then take the Archangel to a different planet and then back to Pacham. Because uh, Father Captain DeSoya apparently has been dead for like 20 days or 30 days, which is a substantial amount of time. Um, especially when your resurrection process is interrupted twice, let alone once, but twice. So, and they also told him that, you know, Gregorius and a bunch of his other men are still being resurrected elsewhere, but he, like, DeSoya is not going to get to see them because he's being in inquisitioned, I guess, inquisited. <laughs> I don't know what the right term is for it, but... It's definitely not looking good for him in regards to that whole situation. So I think that what we're going to find out is that there's a lot more going behind the scenes of this whole capturing Aenea thing for the church, for the Pax, and for specifically the Pope, um, who, if we remember correctly, is Father Hoyt. Uh, after DeRay dies, Hoyt is resurrected because DeRay was carrying Hoyt's um, cruciform from when Hoyt wished for death on Hyperion uh, to the Shrike. And so uh, I think that we're going to find out pretty quickly what the product of his 250-year-long reign is. We're going to find out more about why it is they want Aenea captured and things of that nature, which is great because... I have been wondering this entire time exactly what it is that they're hoping to accomplish in capturing Aenea and basically like forcing her to take on the cruciform. Um, yeah, so that's what's up with Captain DeSoya. It's a lot. Uh, it took up three quarters of the podcast, in fact. So we're going to talk about, after the break, we're going to talk about what is going on with Aenea and Abetic and Endymion on Draconi Septum, which is the planet that they translate to after they get to Hebron. And we're going to talk about that right after this last quick commercial break. 
Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. you've all been waiting for the cliffhangers that are dan simmons is constantly slipping into this amazing godforsaken book <laughs> so the gang ania abedic and endymion all translate from hebron after um Rawl is able to finally recover from his crazy escapade on uh mari infinitum translate to draconi septum when they arrive there, they realize that they are in an ice tunnel, uh, or at least they're in an ice cave. And when they get there, they start to kind of run through the options of which planets it is that they could possibly be on. And they um, realize that... Actually, I just had a, an epiphany, which is kind of funny. We'll get to it. They realize that they're on Draconi Septum because of the environment specifically, Basically, what they realize is they're in a river that's running through a glacier that they don't like they can't see anything in this glacier. Uh, it's pretty bad. So they get there, they turn on their lanterns, and then they float down this river and end up at a giant wall of ice. And the river dips underneath it, of course, because if the river keeps flowing, it has to dip underneath it. So the river dips underneath it, but not so much so that it pulls their boat under, just enough to like kind of slam them up against the wall where they can't move. I don't know exactly how Simmons kind of justifies this because to my knowledge of, you know, like if you put a raft up against a wall and the current pulls under, that it'll eventually pull everything under, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the book isn't necessarily existing to be completely scientifically accurate. There's a suspension of disbelief and everything involved in it. So, you know, take it for what it is. But regardless, um, we find out pretty quickly that they are, in fact, trapped by their own perceptions. They try to push the raft back up the river. They realize that the current's actually really strong, even though they hadn't thought that it was. Because they're in the dark, they don't have as much of a reference for how fast it is that they're moving in this current. And so uh, they go back up, they find the Farcaster portal, and they realize that the river basically gets to be only like a meter wide, which is not wide enough for the raft. And they would get out of the raft, but it's just basically sheer walls on either side. Like they're in a canyon, but it's a canyon made of ice. So there's no river bank, per se, for them to get off on. They start thinking about how it, like what they could possibly do to survive. They have like a heating cube, which is basically like a portable fire that has like 100 hours of battery life before it needs to recharge. I think I would imagine it's solar powered. Most things seem to be solar powered in this universe. So... They decide, uh, or they think about blasting, They and they still have C4, not C4 charges, I don't remember what they're called exactly, plastique charges, I think is what they call them, but they're basically C4 charges, and with remote detonators, and so they realize, or they think about trying to like blow a hole in the side of the canyon, and then they're like, well no, what if that collapses the canyon, and also that doesn't do anything to get us out of here, it just means that we would be huddled up in a little ice cave and it would be kind of warm they're all like basically death by like uh hypothermia is imminent as soon as they run out of energy in the heating cube because you know there's nothing there there's no light when they turn the lanterns off it is complete and total pitch black darkness there's no like little siphon of light to be found anywhere they can't see the surface in any regard it's it's pretty bad um so what they end up deciding to do is go back down to the ice cave, ice wall, 
and and Dimian says that he is going to jump in this freezing cold water. Um, and I cannot like half of these chapters were literally just like this is how cold it is, and it felt a little gratuitous at times, but it really raises the stakes and makes you feel like completely and totally hopeless. And it is totally a reference to Dante's Inferno. Um, if I had to guess, they're in some regard going to be going in reverse from Dante's Inferno at this point, because this is, um, I believe the final circle of hell in Dante's Inferno is the one where it's all ice, and that's where Satan or Lucifer is held, is in this icy wasteland. So my guess is from here they travel in reverse order through the circles of hell in Dante's Inferno, um, and I only say this because as a fellow science fiction writer, I once tried to write a science fiction interpretation of Dante's Inferno. It's a pretty classic thing for like an academic nose in the air, think I'm so great. Yes, I'm speaking negatively about myself, uh, author, science fiction author to do because it's just such a great it's such great source material to base references off of um, in the same way that Joffrey Chaucer's. Canterbury Tales were great material for the first book. I would guess that Dante's Inferno will be great for the last. There's also a reference of like the world ending in either fire or ice, and I believe that it's William Blake who has that series of poems. Um, though Robert's Frost, Robert Frost's name is casually tossed in there. I am never surprised at all of the name drops that um, Dan Simmons throws in there. It feels like in some regard he's kind of trying to imitate the style of like epic poetry of the Odyssey and the Tale of Gilgamesh and the Iliad and such. Um, also, uh, this is very reminiscent of the stylistic choices of, gosh, trying to, not Ezra Pound, um, T.S. Eliot. The poem, like The Wasteland, is basically just a poem referencing a bunch of other poems about a thing that T.S. Eliot is experiencing um, some people specifically believe that it had to do with a certain aspect of his relationship with his future ex-wife, which was a very toxic and negative relationship. So I'm not entirely sure exactly, you know, what it is that he's referencing in all of these illusions and things like that. But I, I imagine that if I did a little digging, there's probably plenty of people who have found out what it is that he's referencing specifically in anything like that so uh in that regard i find it to be interesting regardless sorry back on track uh he decides to dive down into this icy water and put charges along the bottom of this ice wall because the current will carry him under and then hopefully blow a hole in the ice wall that allows them to f drift further downstream so he does, in fact, do this and almost dies in the process of doing this particular thing. <laughs> um, there's a big, there's a whole big chapter on basically like the whole process, and Endymion talks about how awful it is. Blah blah blah. Ends up blowing the charges. They get through because he goes to the side and finds out that the river does continue on, and he can't see the end of it. So if it's just a second um, chamber, then like hopefully it leads somewhere. But if not, then there's no way for him to know. And he can't be in the water any longer or he will die. They pull him back onto the boat. And this is where it gets kind of interesting before the other things happen. Um, he gets on the boat and he's basically dying of hypothermia. They put him in like this special science fiction-y sleeping bag with a thermal blanket, which supposedly will hold all of his heat in. And he's still like not doing so hot. They inject his body with a specific type of adrenaline, which, if I had to guess, Dan Simmons did do the research on how what you're supposed to do with someone who has hypothermia. Um, he was writing this in the 90s, so it wasn't a quick Google search. So probably pretty good on his part to be thorough. But what ends up happening is that Aenea and Abedic both crawl into this sleeping bag with Endymion. And Endymion says that even in the retelling of this particular moment, he is brought to tears. He weeps um, because it's just kind of it's it's really sad um, and it's really powerful that these people would like share something as basic as their body heat with him. And when he's getting back onto the boat, he makes a bunch of references to like him being kind of like Jesus and that Aenea is this Madonna like figure who 
you know, because she knows the future, I think she knows ultimately what happens to Rawl, which my guess is that he dies a pretty awful death. Um, or a very peaceful one. Either way, um, he dies in, in some capacity that she is ama- that she's aware of. And I think that that's, this is all foreshadowing uh, by Dan Simmons for us to kind of figure out what it is that Ania knows and the the conditions of Rawl's death. Because it seems like he's constantly getting into these situations where he basically looks death in the face and survives somehow. Um, a Bedek, uh insists that he would be the logical one to swim because he's designed, he's a, you know, he's half a robot, so he'd be much more acclimated to something like this, but... And Dimian makes the statement that he can't pull because uh, he ties a rope around his waist to get back up the river to the boat when he goes underneath the ice cave. Um, he couldn't pull a Bedek back onto the boat, but a Bedek can pull him. Um, and so it was pretty intense that whole scene. And why was I talking about this? Oh, because and and Dimian keeps getting in these situations. So I think eventually something's going to get him, and it's not going to be fun for him. Um, yeah, I mean he's already going through a bunch of pain, and it seems like he's kind of. You know, if this is a Dante story, then he is going to eventually die in the end, obviously. And it'll be right after he feels as if he's succeeded. Um, and his success will have been bringing the his true love out of hell, uh, up the nine circles of hell uh, that are in Dante's Inferno. I can't remember specifically which book that's, that this is that particular thing is in, but... If Aenea is supposed to be the female figure that he's bringing out of hell, um, you know, Dan Simmons is pretty dead on. And then we could make reasonable predictions about the next few planets and places that they'll visit. But, you know, that's really neither here nor there. They end up going down the second channel and they uh, get to the end of it and it's another ice wall. They decide that they're going to send their uh, calm bracelet down the current tied to a plank um and because the calm unit has like a camera on it and can kind of give basic information and what they find out is that the river keeps going and going and going but like 200 or 300 meters out there's still just ice so basically they're totally trapped they start to accept their death and then they start like you know, rapidly hypothesizing ways to get out of this and what could they do. So ultimately they decide to go back up the river and see if they missed something, which of course they did because there's 60 chapters in this book and we're only on chapter 39. (laughs) So they go back up the river and they find a small little outlet that leads like nowhere. But from that outlet, there's like a cave that goes up that Endymion decides to crawl up. And one of the specific references that they make at the beginning when they realize they're on Draconi Septum is that there's another big game animal on this planet called wraiths. White wraiths, I think is what they're called. And I think it's interesting that they keep on being sent to planets with these like huge monsters. And I'm wondering if that is something that uh, Simmons is going to talk more about. But I am also suspicious that some of these worlds might be labyrinthian worlds, and so this is a labyrinth that they're entering into on this planet, but it's a labyrinth made of glaciers, so or glacial outcroppings. But they climb up and up and up. They have to squeeze and crawl and all this stuff, and they get somewhere, and then they're resting, and they hear footsteps, and the chapter ends, because Dan Simmons is a cruel and horrible master. <laughs> um, and he jumps to Deso- back to DeSoya's story, um, which is so frustrating, because I just I don't know what it could possibly be. Like, if it's a person, because supposedly there are people on Draconi Septum still, if it's the Shrike, if it's a Wraith, we don't really know. All we know is that a Bedek heard footsteps, and now everybody else is about to hear footsteps. And they're just sitting around their little heating cube making a pot of stew. So that is where we'll pick up next week, um, at least in part. I'm going to leave you guys on a cliffhanger like I was left on a cliffhanger. So pretty excited to see where this book is going to go. It's shaping up really nicely. I love the references to Dante's Inferno. If it is, in fact, the reverse Dante's Inferno, I would be thrilled. 
A. Bedick makes a great, um, what is the, Virgil, I think is the poet's name. He makes a great Virgil, if that is what it is that um, uh, Dan Simmons is trying to accomplish. Ania is, of course, a great uh, person to be, quote-unquote, saved, though it does make specific reference to the idea that she is kind of, like, protecting uh, Rawl in some regard. Um, because Rawl says, like, no, I'm supposed to protect you when she's, you know, huddling up against him to give... Or to, you know, share warmth with him so that he doesn't go hypothermic. And I do really appreciate Dan Simmons' handling of that scene because he specifically makes reference to the fact that Andymion cannot feel anything. Um, like, at all. Like, all of his nerve endings are basically fried from the cold. He can barely move. So it's like, you know, because we know that eventually Andymion and um, Ania become lovers. Obviously, after Ania becomes an adult. And I think Simmons is just like kind of he wanted to take away the ambiguity of romance so that he could very firmly place us in an appropriate relationship between these two individuals uh, ania also does make reference to some special powers she might have but we have no idea what those are so there's still a lot more to this book that i'm really excited to get into so make sure you tune in next week we're going to talk about it then if you like the podcast make sure to give us a like and a follow review would be great follow us on facebook Twitter, all of your social media, and uh, leave comments below and let me know what you're thinking of the book so far and if I missed anything. So thanks for listening again, everybody. Stay safe out there. Um, Things are still relatively not normal. Hopefully we'll get back to normal sometime in the future-ish. So thanks for listening, everybody, and have a great day. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also find Follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.